Go on and lift him up here tonight and let God have his way with us. Let him have his way. Let him have his way. Let him have his way. Lord, we thank you and God, we honor you for everything that you're doing, God, here tonight. And we ask you to have your way in every bit of this service, Lord, in everything that we do. We allow you to have your preeminence, Lord. And we thank you for all good gifts that come down from the Father of lights. Can you say amen? How many glad to be in the house of the Lord here tonight? Amen. I'm glad to be here. I'm kind of, it's going to be hard for me to adjust. I know we're doing a little adjusting. All these wires hanging off me tonight because we're trying to get the sound on our video as well. And being over here is going to be a little bit different. So I kind of, to myself, sound a little muffled even in my ear right now. So just bear with me. But I believe the anointing and the Holy Ghost working together is going to do the work that needs to be done. Amen. Amen. Praise God. If you need a study guide, just raise your hand and they'll make sure you get a study guide around here. If you need one, if you don't have one, raise your hand and we're going to be continuing. I, I went on and, and continued this, this particular lesson because of popular demand. Uh, I wasn't planning on going any further with it, but uh, some folks wanted to hear more on the flesh. So that's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> Say that's not hard. That's not hard. It's not hard. So uh, this lesson will be part two of what we began last week and, and letting the Lord do what he wants to do and, and see uh, what he's ministering. There's a, there's a ministering spirit. I know it's a little bit warm right now, but in Ethiopia, they're a lot hotter. You know, <laughs> praise God. And I was preaching one time in El Salvador and we were about 150 degrees in the room and I was wearing a suit coat and we were sweating and just dripping sweat, you know, and we were preaching and, and, and the guys out there were just enjoying the Lord. They were all sweating. I was sweating. They were sweating. And then when they baptized some, one of the pastors baptized somebody while I was preaching, baptized somebody and the guy sat in the front row and he was just glad to have water on him. He was sitting on the front row. The whole service was water dripping off. But I know he was probably the coolest one in the building. So it's not that hot. So we thank God for that. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to still be in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 5 through 8, and um, we just want God to have his way. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 8, simply states, Paul speaking to the church at Rome, for they, are after, that they, are, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit. Everybody say after the Spirit. Yes. After the Holy Ghost. The things of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind or the fleshly mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh. Everybody say in the flesh. In the flesh. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. We're going to talk about the flesh again in part two. And, and if you can, uh, Mikey, if you'll keep time or whoever's over here, Alex, keep time. So at uh, 8.15, give me a signal, okay, because I don't have a clock up here. Let's talk about it. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you and we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And we ask you to be with us in this Bible study. Lord, I pray that our flesh, our human nature, our carnal man would be laid down at this altar, Lord, and for the days and years to come in our families, in our friendships, on our jobs, in our personal lives, even in the church that you've allowed us to be part of. Lord, we ask you in Jesus' name to have your way tonight and allow us to walk with you, Lord, and to be better than we were when we came in. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Can you say in Jesus' name? Jesus. Amen. One more time. Let's just put our hands together in the house of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. Thank you for standing so long. The flesh. Everybody say the flesh. I'm going to give you just a little bit of review for maybe uh, one or two of you weren't here last time. But we talked about the flesh. And one of the things we wanted to note was the flesh is not talking about the human body. In other words, we're not talking about our flesh as far as what we're born into and what came out of our mother's womb. We said the flesh was also known as the human nature or the carnal mind. We quoted Thayer's Greek lexicon which stated uh, and defined this word
word flesh is sarxis, which means mere human nature, the earthly, natural man, part of, uh, depart, apart from divine influence. In other words, God isn't influencing your flesh. So when we act out in the flesh, it's not God. You can call it God, but it's not God. And therefore, because of this, Vines goes on to say, I'm sorry, uh, um, Theos goes on to say, and therefore prone to sin and opposed to God. According to Vines, Vines' expository dictionary of the New Testament words, it says the flesh is a, a seat of, of for man's sin, or a seat for sin. It's where sin relaxes and sin gets really comfortable inside of our flesh. I talked about it being reclined there. We talked about flesh is nourished in three desires. We talked about it being nourished in the, the lust of the flesh, which means what we handle and touch, and the lust of the eyes, what we perceive and what we think about, and the pride of life in our lives, and what is reinforcing self-confidence or self-assurance or depending on yourself. We talked about the following are seven observations concerning the flesh. The flesh affects every human being in the world or that was born in the earth. Every single one of us in this room has flesh or has a human nature. And so all of us, because we were born into it, born into sin, shaped in iniquity and all that, we all have been affected by this thing called the flesh. We talked about the flesh appeals to our base nature. In other words, the lowest part of us, You can when, when you act out in the flesh, you act out in that animal-like, humanistic um, attitude and spirit, and it really comes out of us. We talk about the flesh loves sin and loves to sin. Its job is to sin, and it loves it. We talk about the flesh reinforces strongholds in our lives. In other words, what you're struggling with, the flesh reinforces it and ties you up to where you can't get free from it. If you were chained and bound to something, the flesh somehow tightens it up. And every time you act out in the flesh, it tightens it up so that you can't and I can't get free from it. We talk about the flesh resists God and His Word. In other words, the Word of God is, is, is saying one thing and the flesh is saying another thing and it fights against what God really wants. We talk about the flesh never produces anything that God endorses. No matter how much you want God to endorse what you're doing, when we act out in the flesh, God will never endorse our flesh. He'll never say, oh, that's good and you acted out in the flesh. And that's good because the ends justifies the means. That's worldliness and the world says the end justifies the means, but God's kingdom is not like that. He never endorses our flesh. And the last we said the flesh rewards us with a place on death row. In other words, if I continue to walk according to my flesh, the last place that I'm going to end up is hell. And that's not a good place. We talked about five ways to help control the flesh. We said flesh can be controlled by respecting the power of the flesh. In other words, realizing you're human, I'm human, we're all susceptible to our flesh, and we've got to constantly keep it down and realize that it does have power and it can take control. We talked about the flesh can be controlled by balanced biblical teaching. In other words, uh, as I said, Billy Cole, Brother Billy Cole said one time, the only way that you deal with flesh is not to have a good prayer meeting. Well, a good prayer meeting will help, but uh, not to cast it out, but the best way is through teaching. In other words, good balanced teaching. I guarantee to you. If you become very good and you become a student of the Word and you have a lot of Word on the inside of you, the less you will be prone to yield yourself to the flesh. Because what will happen when the pressure of life is put on you, flesh won't come out, but the Word of God will rise to the top and deal with the situation. And we said that one of the other five things, the flesh can be controlled by enlisting others to hold us accountable. In other words, having people that you trust, say somebody I trust, somebody I trust. Okay? Somebody that you trust that can speak into your life and that can help you along the way. These people have to be wise people, but not only wise people, they have to be godly people. Because if they're not godly, then they're going to give you unwise attention and unwise advice. By the ways that we open that, it's going to get worse. Right. I don't know. Maybe let's try it. Let's try it. Give it a shot. Is it coming through? Okay. Let it come through. I'm, I'm hot up here too. <laughs> so you, you want to get wise counsel, but not only wise counsel, you want godly counsel. There's safety in a multitude of counsel. And the, and the hoary head or the gray-haired person is very wise if they're giving you godly counsel. It's not just in age, but it could be in spiritual maturity as well. So we're not just talking about 
age or being on the earth long. The flesh can be controlled by refusing to feed its cravings. In other words, when it starts growling and your stomach starts growling in the flesh and you want something that you know that's against the Word of God, you've got to be able to refuse and resist and refuse to feed it. Everybody tell me, refuse to feed it. And then finally, he says, the flesh can be controlled by obeying promptings of the Holy Spirit. In other words, when God begins to nudge you, you obey Him. Anytime we, we uh, sin and the flesh pops up, God always responds. If you're a Christian and you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've been walking with God for any amount of time, every single time when you start to stray off and start to do it your, start to do it your way, God always, everybody say always. He always responds to give you promptings and say, don't do that. Now, that voice may be soft and that voice may be gentle and sometimes that voice may be very coarse and may be very hard and very loud. But nonetheless, God always gets your attention because He knows what you hear. It's just that we can get good at becoming callous to hearing the Word of God and hearing Him when He speaks to us um, personally. Let's start today in part two of what I want to talk about. The following are three things that the flesh loves. See, the flesh loves some things. Flesh loves some things. That's right. And the number one thing that flesh loves is sin. Our flesh, everybody say my flesh. Our flesh loves to sin. To sin means to miss the mark. Let me give you a, a good definition of what sinning is. Sinning, is, the word sin, means to miss the mark. In other words, if I had a bullseye behind me, and all of you were throwing darts at the bullseye, Whenever you hit it in the dead center, that's considered bullseye. Anything outside of the center and directly in the center is considered missing the mark. The same way the Lord says, you sin, I sin, every time we miss the mark. And the only way we can actually hit the mark is through the blood of Jesus Christ. All have missed the mark and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So to sin lives outside of the mark. And the flesh loves sin because sin is not bound to hit it every time. In other words, we start making excuses why we can't live for God. We begin to give excuses why we can't just submit our flesh and therefore we live outside the center and don't allow God to put us on the mark. That's right. Sin is anything that doesn't have God's endorsement. And that's one way that you can think about it. And that's just my own definition. But sin is anything that does not have God's endorsement. In other words, what I'm getting ready to do and what I'm getting ready to say, even what I'm thinking on right now, if it's not endorsable by God and it's not condoned by God, then it falls in the line and goes into the category of sin. But thanks be to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, even when you make mistakes on an accident, God's blood brings you back to where you need to be. So you don't have to walk in fear and say, oh, I'm sinning all the time. Well, anything short of the glory of God is sin, but it's because of the blood and your faith in the blood and trusting God and saying, God, I trust you to cleanse me and keep me under the blood, that it begins to flow. I'm talking about sin that we partake of that we know isn't right. And it puts us on the other side. And the only way you can get back on the mark is you've got to ask God to forgive you of that particular thing. Sin is anything that, that doesn't have God's endorsement on it. Paul declared in verse 5 of our scripture text, For those who are, who are according to the flesh are controlled by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify their flesh. Sin is out there and our flesh is attracted to it to where we start running after it because our flesh wants to be fed. The Apostle Paul noted in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3, I'm reading from the Amplified, We as well as you once lived and conducted ourselves in the passions of our flesh. Our behavior governed by our corrupt and sensual nature, obeying the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind, our cravings dictated by our senses and our dark imaginings. In other words, we, we really want, wanted this so bad. The flesh loves sin. 
First John chapter 2, verse 16, 15 and 16. I'm reading from the expanded Bible. It says, do not love the world. Everybody say the world. world. That's this system and it's the way that they've bought into things and said, well, you know, everybody else is doing it. That's the world. Well, what about them over there? Well, that's the world. We're talking about not just one specific thing in the world. We're talking about the way the world perceives things, the way the world approaches things, the way the world uh, accumulates things, the way the world gets what they get is not how the church should operate. And notice what he says. Do not love the world, nor the things in associated with the world. If you love the world, this is what the Lord is saying to one of his, his men of God. He says, if you love the world, the love or uh, of or for the Father is not in me or in you. Verse 16 goes on to say, For these are the ways of the world, wanting to please our sinful, notice, selves, the desires, the lusts of the flesh, wanting the sinful things we see, the desire, lust of the eyes, and being too proud of what we have, the pride of life or possessions. None of these things come from the Father, but all, notice, say all, all of them come from the world. In other words, it's not bad to have desire, but it's bad to have a desire that does not fall into the category where God will endorse. Sin says, I'll endorse this and I'll endorse that. It's okay as far as you can go. It's called lasciviousness, living outside the boundaries of, of anything. No laws, nothing. I get to do whatever I want to do. That was the generation that I grew up in, the 60s, and where they said, if it feels good, do it. If you feel like you want to do it, do it. And, and that's why I, I live the way that I live. It's because it felt good, so I did what I wanted to do. Once I came to the Lord, I started seeing structure, and I began to see order, and I began to see what God is really wanting to do. And that's what he's trying to get across to somebody, because our flesh is so powerful, and it's been fed from the time we were born, because we were born in iniquity. We were shaped in iniquity. We were born in sinfulness and in, in the sinful flesh. So now we're just walking this way, but when we come to God, all of a sudden, God says there's boundaries. All of a sudden, you've got to live within the confines of His Word. And guess what? If you learn to walk that way, you will see that it will be better for you. You'll be happier. You won't, I mean, you won't have to go through the same old thing that your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your uncle, your aunt, your grandma, your grandpa, and all of them had to go through just to learn the simple point and what they try and tell you once they get older and say, just live for God. <laughs> I mean, Solomon, after he'd done all that he did, married all the wives that he had, 700 wives and 300 girlfriends, and the richest man that ever walked the earth, the man who had everything that he wanted, had the tiger by the tail, owned things, and had power, prestige, and everything he wanted. And he said, you know, I've looked at life. And here's it, to sum it up. He said, fear God, put God in his rightful place, have reverence for him, be in awe of God, fear God, and keep his commandments. It's only to love God and love people. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You know, the rich man came to Jesus and he said, Good master, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Notice, he had everything everybody in this world wants. He had riches, he had power, and he had the, the, the notoriety. Everything that everybody in this world seeks after through their jobs and through uh, people and through positions and all these things. And he said, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. You know them. Do not steal, do not kill, do not bear false witness and all that. And he said, oh, I've done these ever since my youth. He said, one thing you lack. Take all that you have and sell it. And then give it to the poor and then come follow me. The man walked away sorrowfully because he had much possessions. And there's nothing wrong with possessions. But it was where his love was. His love was to the world and not towards God. His love was for what he had accumulated and not towards God. But God said, if you really love me, give it all away and come serve me and see what happens. You'll have a better life. God wasn't calling him to a worse life. God was calling him to a blessed life. A blessed life is not in the things and what we possess or what we own or who we know. But a blessed life is knowing him. And if you know him, you are blessed. That's why you can be dirt poor and still be blessed. It's not based upon the things that I possess. Possess. Life is much more than that. The flesh on your study guide and loves sin because of its temporary sensual satisfaction. You can write that in there. 
loves sin because of its temporary sensual satisfaction. Notice I said temporary. And I said last week how that Moses, he chose rather to suffer with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I'm not saying that it doesn't feel good to sin. I'm just saying it feels good to our flesh, but it's temporary. Temporary. It's a band-aid. Yes. It's like when you uh, are needing a cigarette for you people that have been delivered from cigarettes yet. Okay? I smoked for eight years, so I understand how it is when you want that cigarette, how you'll pick up that butt on the ground and you'll begin to piece things together. And, and back when you had rolling papers, you would roll a bunch of them together just to get one cigarette. Okay, I understand that. It's because of the craving for the nicotine that's going on inside the body that wants more, but it's temporary. It's just like drugs. And those of you that have been addicted to drugs or maybe are addicted, addicted to drugs even now, it's that craving that comes up that wants it to be satisfied. And that's what sin does. It wants to satisfy. It only puts a Band-Aid on it for just a minute because when you wake up or when tomorrow comes or another day comes down the road or a few hours go by, you're going to need something else to make you feel good for a little while again. That's why when Jesus was looking at the woman at the well, he said, woman, if you would have asked, I would have given you living water. That you wouldn't have to come here to draw water any longer. Because if you drink of this water, you really drink of this water that I'm trying to give you, you'll never thirst again. And see, that's what sin does. It makes us thirsty for more and more and more depravity. We become more depraved. We become more separated from God through sin because we indulge in it because our flesh wants it. But your flesh will never be satisfied. The Bible says hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. When you get a million dollars, you'll want another million dollars. When you get one thing here and one thing there, you'll want more of that. If you're doing it according to the flesh. But if God is accumulating it to you and God has given it to you, you no longer put your trust in riches. You don't put your trust in your family. You don't even put your trust in yourself. You put your trust in, in God. And you say, naked I came in this world and naked I'm going to return to Him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If I'm rich, I'm going to praise Him. If I'm poor, I'm going to praise Him. Blessed be the name of God. I'm not depending on anything to bring me satisfaction other than Jesus Christ. I said it when I was talking about contentment contentment and Paul saying I've learned the secret and the secret is this that God is with me all the time he strengtheneth me I put my trust in him because God is the one giving me the strength whether I have or I don't have and that is the secret of contentment that whether you have or you don't have God is on board whether you don't have anything to back you up or, or you have a, a lot to back you up, you realize that, God, I have everything I need, need in you. I am sufficient in your sufficiency. In other words, as long as I know that you're here, it doesn't matter if I hear you, as long as I know you're around in the room, as long as I know that you're going to go with me and through it with me, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me or which strengtheneth me. Can you say amen? Go ahead and put your hands together for the Lord. But the flesh loves sin because of its temporary sensual satisfaction. Number two on your study guide, the flesh. The flesh loves the spotlight. The flesh loves the spotlight. That's why when, when you come into the church, and, and I'm talking about church people now for a minute. When you come into the church, a lot of people, when they first get saved, they're, they're automatically attracted to the pulpit. Because it's a spotlight. And the flesh loves this. But the flesh can't handle this. <laughs> I like that. The flesh, you know, it's like, what's that kind of thing? Can you touch this? <laughs> yeah, Empty hand. Yeah. Empty hand. The flesh can't touch this. Because it, the thing that you seek will destroy you. That's right. and, and that's very important to understand. You can never fulfill in the flesh what has begun in the spirit. Paul calls it witchcraft when you walk that way. He said, oh, you foolish Galatians. In Galatians, I believe, chapter 2. Oh, you foolish Galatians. Who hath cast a spell on you? Who hath bewitched you? To think that having begun 
in the spirit, you are now made perfect in the flesh. In other words, they wanted to return back to the law under and governed under circumcisions and, and, and washings and all these things. They wanted to be governed by that again. He said, who has put a, a, a spell on you that you're now going to be made perfect in the flesh? And this thing began in the spirit. So I say, you know, the, the flesh has this desire to have the spotlight because of our fallen nature. In Matthew chapter 23, let me, let me uh, read you something out of here, out of Matthew 23, verse 5 through 7. The story had to say what it had to say about the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus said they do everything, or everything they do is for show. Scribes and Pharisees. They were good guys. They were respectable guys. They were the religious leaders. They were the ones that were endorsed to carry God's word. But notice, it says, everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside. And they wear robes with extra long tassels. And they love to sit at the head table at banquets and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and be called rabbi, pastor. <laughs> you gotta be, we have to be careful because our flesh loves the spotlight. And when you feel that you love and you're drawn to the spotlight, that's a time when you need to take a step back and do an evaluation and ask, why am I doing what I'm doing? God has a way of squeezing it out of it. Trust me, He'll do that. But you don't want to go that route. You want to go the route where you're saying, God, if this is what you want me to do, and spotlights aren't bad, I'm just saying our flesh. Everybody say my flesh. When I'm walking in the flesh, that's what I desire. And our flesh, which is, uh, I, I think I clearly stated that it's in every one of us, our flesh is drawn to it like, an, like a bug to a light. <laughs> and don't know that it's for our death. You know, you know, insects, they have these little lights that zap them. That's what our flesh is like. Our flesh is drawn into that spotlight to be recognized, to be known. Everybody's trying to make their mark on the world. I want to I create something. I want to have an album. I want to have a, a tape series. I want to I do this. I want to have a church. I want to have a, a, a this thing or that thing so that people will know that I'm here and I'm important. I'm important. God already said you're important. God already said you're important. God already said you're the apple of his eye. God already said, I know the hairs upon your head. God already says, I am always watching you. He's studying you. He loves you. He so loves you. And so when we begin to get at gratification because of our flesh, we go down a slippery slope. And it's that spotlight that draws us. As I said a few seconds ago, the flesh loves on your study guide. The flesh loves the spotlight because of our fallen nature. Because our fallen nature needs it to survive. For our flesh to survive, it's got to be fed. And so this spotlight feeds our fallen nature. That's why you can have the spotlight, but you're still suicidal. That's why you can have the spotlight and you're still addicted to drugs. That's why you can have the spotlight and you still have a terrible marriage. That's why you can be in the spotlight and everybody thinks everything's okay, but it's not. I'm telling you. It's the flesh. It loves it. It feeds it. It keeps you going. Somebody asked me just, I think it was yesterday, I was, walking, I was with the police officer riding for about 12 hours and he was asking, he was asking this question. He never read with a cha never rode with a chaplain. He had never read a chaplain. He's a young guy, 27 years old, and uh, on, got the tiger by the tail right now, you know. And and one of the questions he asked: How can a man or how can a woman be addicted to drugs? And his brother is addicted to heroin. How can a man or how can a woman be addicted to drugs? and not have food and all these other things. He said, some of them die. He said, but how can he be an alcoholic or how can he be a heroin addict or a drug addict or something like that and function for years and years and years and years? For some of these things, the enemy is so slick that he'll let you have never get cirrhosis of the liver, never allow your kidneys to fail, 
where somebody's he's eating fruit and vegetables and taking care of his body and he's on dialysis. What's the equity in that? Not everybody's like that, but some people can be functional alcoholics, functional drug addicts. And his question was, how can they, how can they survive? How can they make it? I'm telling you, the flesh as it's being fed sometimes, uh, if it's to grip you and to hold you and keep you in check, the enemy will not even allow you to go down, but he'll sustain you. And if you, as long as you keep feeding it, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. And the spotlight, we love it because it feeds our fallen nature. It feeds us and it causes us to survive because people are looking at it and, and we need that. I mean, if you're living your whole life trying to get your dad's approval, if you're living your whole life still trying to get your mom's approval, if you're living your whole life still trying to get approval from others, it's coming from your flesh. Hurt, of course, but it's still coming from the flesh. So you'll do everything in the flesh to try and um, get that approval. I know my dad's probably going to watch this, and, and my dad, thank God he's living for God now, and my stepmother, and they get these uh, tapes and everything now. But for years, I lived my life wanting to please my dad. It wasn't that he was causing me and wanting me to please him. It's just something that was deep down inside. So the majority of my accomplishments in life as a younger man in my 20s was to get the approval of my dad, which I already had. But there was something on the inside that was just desiring it and, and kept feeding it. And the only way that I could accomplish that was in the flesh. So therefore, it didn't matter where I, whatever position I was trying to get or whatever status I was going to try and get. I didn't use the same, same logic when I came in the church. And I, on purpose, denied it and said, Lord, I will not use the same logic. But if I wanted a position in my job, if I wanted a position in the sporting world, if I wanted a position, I totally manipulated the system so that, that when the, the people started looking, they would look this way. And it was all in the flesh. When I came to God and I came to the church, I realized that those qualities were on the inside of me of influence and everything. I decided, I said, Lord, in private, I said, God, I will not manipulate you to get what I want or where I think I want or what I think you want for my life. So therefore, everything to this point, I can say to this point, everything in my life that's happened to me with God to this point was because I just said, what do you want to do with my life? And God just began to direct it. But now I can't take any credit for it. But the flesh always wants to take the credit. The flesh always wants to be in the spotlight. And, if you, and you can get so comfortable and you can even give credit to God even though you know it was in the flesh. you got to be very careful with this. Dr. Seagrave said, the thing that I battle with the most... Because he's, he's a theologian and he has the scriptures and he's got a good handle. And he was probably one of my greatest mentors as I was coming up. But Dr. Seagrave, when we talk about theologically, but Dr. Seagrave said, the thing that I battle with the most is pride. Because I think all of you are wrong. And I'm right. That's what he said. He believes everybody else is wrong and he's right. And he knows that's not the case. But pride begins to come up and pride has its roots in Satan. And so then when you begin to act out in pride and pride consumes us, all of a sudden we're acting like the son of Satan. And we don't even know it. Flesh. Amen. Let's go on number three on your study guide. The flesh. The flesh loves man-made rules. Is that her? Yeah. The flesh loves man-made rules. Not God-made rules. Man-made rules. I'm making the distinction here. Moving in the Holy Ghost. Okay? And you feel comfortable. <laughs> the flesh makes man-made rules. Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 2 and through 4, He said, The teachers of the law, I'm reading from the expanded Bible, The teachers of the law, scribes, and the Pharisees, have the authority to interpret what the law of Moses says. This, he's endorsing them. Verse 3 goes on to say, So you should obey do, practice, and follow what they tell you, but their lives are not good examples for you to follow. Do not follow their actions. They tell you to do things, 
but they themselves don't do them. For they say, say, but do not. Say, but do not. They make strict rules. Notice, they make strict rules. Tie up heavy loads, burdens that are hard to carry. And try to force people to obey them. He goes on to say, but they are unwilling to help those who struggle under the weight, notice, of their rules. When we're talking about the flesh, it loves man-made rules because now I can make a rule that makes me look good. I can make a rule that everyone else has to do, but I don't have to do, but I can act like I'm doing it. They love man-made rules. The flesh, it loves it because it pumps me up. It makes me feel good and I feel like, man, I'm on top of the world. Paul stated in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 through 22, If then you who have, you have died with Christ to material ways of looking at things and have escaped from the world's crude and elemental notions and teachings of externalism, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to rules and regulations such as, not just rules and regulations, but he gives uh, an endorsement of what he's talking about, such as, do not handle this, do not taste that, do not touch, even touch them, talking about Gentiles, referring to things, of uh, things all of which perish with being used. To do this is to follow human precepts and doctrines or teachings. Such practices have indeed an outward appearance that popularly pass for wisdom in prompting self-imposed rigor, rigor of devotion and delight in self-humiliation and severity of discipline of the body. But they are of no value in checking the indulgence of the flesh, the lower nature. Instead, they do not honor God, but serve only to indulge the flesh. That's why it's important when you're talking about rules and regulations that you're going to live by. Some things God is asking you to do because He's talking to you. And there's other things God is asking you to do because it's the Word of God. And it's the Word of God that we need to obey. But when we get to the place where we think everything, every revelation, everything that God is telling me, He's telling them to, and He's telling them to, and next thing you know, there's no limit to it because it makes you look good, but it doesn't make God look good. And God is saying, I'm not even in that. It doesn't mean that we don't have rules and regulations according to the Word. What it does mean is, when my flesh is involved... And my flesh is behind the scenes making all of this up just to benefit me. There's something wrong. Can you say amen? See, the flesh on your study guide loves man-made rules because of a superiority complex. A superiority complex. You can write that in there. The, the flesh loves man-made rules because of this, a superiority complex. I feel greater than I feel better than everyone else. See, the scribes and the Pharisees had a problem with this because they had 613 laws that they were asking the people to obey. 613, and God never gave all of those laws. They started building, what they started to do was build fences around the laws of God, about what God said this, but I'm saying, let's take it a little bit further wow. to protect God. And God never was in that. He said, I want you to learn how to walk and to listen to my voice. I want you to learn how to love me. I want you to move into a relationship. See, see what happens is, uh, is because people are not willing to obey God's word and walk in his word and obey his word, what happens is they said, you know, I'm not going to obey that because I know that's wrong, but I, I'm not even going to obey this because I think it's right, but I'm not going to obey. I'm going to do what I want to do and let God sort it out. Not a good way to live. Let's talk about this real quick. Here are two things that God, that the flesh hates. Two things that the flesh hates. We see what it loves. Let's see what it hates. The flesh hates God. You say, no, my flesh loves God. No. I don't think so. My flesh doesn't love God. He doesn't want to do what God wants it to do. Paul notes in verse 7 of our scripture text, the carnal mind, the fleshly mind, the human thinking, the carnal mind is enmity, which means hostile against God. So when I'm in the flesh, 
I'm fighting against God. The flesh hates God. There's only love and there's hate in God's economy. It's not kind of, I love you, Lord, sometimes. No, either you love Him or you don't. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my word. You'll keep my commandments. And my commandments are not grievous. They will not cause you grief and they will not cause you pain. So our flesh hates God. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 1 and 5, This sin is the message we have heard of Him and declared unto you that God is light. And in Him is no darkness. So now we're defining God as light. Notice what else it says. And Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. God is light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus goes on to say in John chapter 3, verse 20, reading from the Amplified, For every wrongdoer hates loathes, detests the light. And that light is God or Jesus and will not come out into the light but shrinks from it, the light, lest his works, his deeds, his activities, his conduct be exposed and reproved. So if God's the light, Jesus is the light, and he's drawing us into the light, but I want to do what I want to do. I want to walk in the flesh. That means I hate the light and the light is God. The light is Jesus. And so if I, the flesh in me hates God. In other words, it wants to do what it wants to do outside of the will of God. No matter what God has already said. And you say amen. Amen. I know it's tough. The flesh hates God because of possible, write this in your study guide there, because of possible exposure. The flesh hates God because of possible exposure. Lest I come into the light and my deeds, my activities, what I'm really all about, be discovered, exposed, other people know. I'm revealed for what I really am. So the flesh nurtures itself, hides itself, withdraws from the light, not just in, in the light of this room, but in the light of God's presence. It doesn't seek to be close to Him, because if I get close to Him, He may reveal who I really am. But the closer you get to the light, the closer you get to God, the more intimate you become with Him, the more you see yourself, and you see yourself like Isaiah and says, Woe is me, for I am a man that's undone, a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. You fall on your face and you realize, Man, I got issues. The flesh. Second thing about what the flesh hates. The flesh hates submission. The flesh hates submission. We resist it. Verse 7 of our scripture text from the expanded Bible reads it like this. When people's thinking is controlled by the sinful self, sinful nature, flesh, they are against, hostile to God because they refuse to obey, to submit to God's law and really are not even able to obey, submit to God's law. The flesh hates bowing down submission. Paul noted in Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 but I say walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit responsive to and controlled by controlled and guided by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. Then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and desires of the flesh of human nature without God. My flesh has no God in it. Do you realize that? So when I'm acting out in the flesh, there's no God there. It's just me. The same way when you're acting out in your flesh, 
It's not God. It's you. And what happens is when the pressures of life are put on you, when you're going through the dire straits, when things are just going just right and it seems like all hell is breaking out against you, what happens is who you really are is going to rise to the top. When the pressure is on and, the, and it's being, you're being squeezed, something is going to begin to come up and if it's, our flesh is not under submission and our flesh is not under, under obedience, what happens is it begins to rise up and God's not mad at that. He's mad at if you don't want to do anything about it and you say, I'm good with that and you let it go right back down on the inside of you and hide it until you're mad again or until you're disappointed again or until you're hurt again. What He wants you to do is deal with the real you. Because every one of us has flesh. And life, circumstances, trials, even God himself will allow pressure to be put on you to see what's inside of you. He said, I didn't give myself to man. Why? He said, because I knew it was in man. He didn't give himself wholly to man because he knew it was in man. But man... The closer you get to Him, sometimes it seems like, man, the pressure is on. It's because God wants to squeeze it out of you. Dr. Jeffers, and many of you know who he is, and, and before he got married, and he said, you know, when he was being uh, persecuted in the flesh, being persecuted by others so bad, and he was getting mad, he said, God, why? And then the Lord just simply asked him, this is what he said, the Lord said to him, I thought you were dead. It just shows you you're not. It just shows you you still have some dying to do. And see, God allows a lot of things to come into our lives so that he can refine us. So we can be like that diamond or whatever it is he's trying to, to, to take through the fire, the refiner's fire. And to, to purge us and to make us into this masterpiece. When it's all said and done, your, your armor and everything on you is just going to be so polished up. The majority of you are going to make it to heaven. And when you go to heaven, it's not because you just had the easy street. Okay? It's because you had to deal with your flesh. You had to bring, as Paul said, your flesh under submission. I had to bring my body under submission. He said, I had to beat it into submission. I had to bring it under submission. Less having done all that I do, the preaching and the teaching and, and the, all the evangelizing, that's having preached to others, I myself become a castaway. I had to daily die to my flesh. Two things. Wrapping up here. Two things that help our flesh to stay, stay submitted. Number one, submission to God, or A on your study guide, submission to God. At this point, that seems easy. B, submission to others. I have other, but it should be others. Submission to others. That means submitting wives, submitting to your husbands, Husbands submitting to your wives, submitting to one another. That means employees submitting to your employers. Okay. That means friends mutually submitting to each other. That means submitting to authorities with, even within the church realm. Submitting to authorities in governmental realms. Submission to others. This will help keep your flesh submitted when you learn to say, God, I'm going to be totally submitted unto you. Then I'll be able to resist the devil. Then I'll be able to fight on your field. But then I'll be able to go forward. I'll submit to God, but also I want to learn, and this is the harder part, I want to learn how to submit to others. Those closest to you sometimes are the hardest people to submit to. Children, submit to your parents. It's hard. Because why? Not because they're wrong. Not because they're right. Because of your flesh. It wants to do what it wants to do. The flesh hates submission. Last thing on your study guide. Because of personal control issues. You want to be in charge. You want to be boss. You want to call the shots. You want to say when it's over. You want to say when it's right. You want to be right. I want to be right. So the flesh has control issues. In other words, we want to direct the direction of our ship, of our life, of everything. But I want you to consider one thing as I close here. Because 
I think it, I need to say it. I just feel prompted to say it. I don't know why, but I'm going to say it. What if there is a God? What if there is a God? And you say, why would I say that? Because I think sometimes the way we live our life, we act like there is no God. So I ask somebody in this place who may be walking in the flesh, what if there is a God? See, because when I walk in the flesh, I act as though there is no God. That's right. I act like He doesn't exist. That He's not everywhere like He said present. That He's not with me always. That He's not beholding the good and the evil just alike. He's not going everywhere and being everywhere so that He can behold all things and know all things. What if there is a God? So I say to my friends that may be walking that way or brother or sister who may feel like, man, I can just do what I want to do. What if there is a God? It's a fearful thing, Scripture says, to fall into the hands of the living God. You don't want God to judge you. I'd rather let somebody that I love in this world judge me. See, because God is black and He's white, but He's also long-suffering. So what He does, He sets up this system so all of us can work it all out. He gives us so much in this Word that all of us can be without excuse. I mean, He gives us so much and gives you so much insight so that you can say, man, I know somewhat is what's going to happen. It's like reading a newspaper today and, and I know some things that other people don't know and they're, they're not, they don't have a clue. Get around sinners. Rub shoulders with them and talk with them. Not trying to beat them over the head with the Bible, but just listen to them. They are clueless to life and what life is all about. When they think about somebody like you, they think you're part of an institution. A poobah club. I don't need that. I got a boat. You know, I got my buddies over at the bar. I mean, you got your people at the church. I got my people at the bar. Same thing, right? It, they don't have a clue. What you are involved in is in eternal. And God is trying to prepare you. But your flesh, and that's what I'm talking about, the flesh. Our flesh cannot receive the things of the Spirit because they're spiritually discerned. But unless you understand this, that there is a God, and this God has called you and ordained you and is setting you up and saying, I want you to come into a relationship with you, with me because I've got so much in store for you. Not on the other side. I've got so much in store for you on this side. I want you to make an impact. I don't want you fighting with people. That's why Paul said, uh, you're yet carnal because when I come to the church uh, and I pass by, I see you that you have factions uh, and you have warrings. Uh, this one can't stand that one. This one is can't, not standing this one. Uh, this one's marriage and this one's wife. And, and all these kinds of things, that should not be. That's right, amen. amen. You're different. You're called out. Right. You're special. Yeah. You're peculiar. Yeah. You're a holy nation. Yeah. I've called you to show forth the praises of your God. Yeah. But you'll never do it. Yeah. Walking according to your flesh. Yeah. If you want to see great things in God, don't seek the spotlight. Yeah. Don't seek praises from other people. Don't seek what desires you have in yourself that make you feel good. Seek God. Start running after hard after God. Don't seek rules to keep you in balance. Seek God. And what will happen is God will reveal himself to you. And what you'll do is uh, you'll submit your life to him and his word. Uh, and then all of a sudden serving people will not be hard for you because you're not trying to get anything from it. All you're trying to do is serve God. Then his voice uh, will begin to magnify in your ears. Uh, and then you'll hear him more clearly. And you'll know where to turn uh, and what to do. You will be able to know when sin knocks at the door and crouches down uh, behind bushes. Uh, you will be able to see it coming uh, from afar off because your spiritual senses are uh, 
activated and your fleshly senses are numbed and they're dying and they're deadened. They will not be able to affect you the way that it used to. And then when people make you mad and people get on your nerves and when you want to say something, you realize there's something greater than what my, I'm going to get out of my flesh. There's something greater that can be won from this. I know my God is waiting to use me even now. God is in. Come on. Let's walk in the spirit. 